Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar. Today's topic is on digital lending. All of us here today. Uh, my name is uh, Elizabeth Njoki. I, I am an associate advocate at uh, the firm of Njogu and associate advocate. I'm pretty sure most, if not all of us here, have interacted with uh, uh, digital lending. Um, if you have not probably used the most common one is I'm sure. Um, there are so many other digital lending platforms and every other time they're always in your inbox, you're receiving messages, uh, soft loan available, quick and easy access. It's very, very, very easy to get access to loans. Unlike um, a few years ago, if you needed a loan, it was so cumbersome, you know, the banking system needs you to, to give them collateral, to show them you have assets that they can secure uh, your, the loan that you, you want to take. It, it has not been easy for, for so many people, especially the unbanked, because um, a significant population of, of, the, of the Kenyan population is actually um, falls under the category of people that are unbanked. They don't have a bank account, you know. With digital lending, it has become easy for this group of people to access credit, you know, without collateral. No one is asking you to to give them your logbook or a title deed. You just need to go to your phone, download an app, a, a few buttons here and there, you have your loan into your, into your phone. The essence of today's webinar is just to have a discussion around the whole area of digital lending, what is the good, what is the bad, and what is the law around it. Our guest speaker today is Alan Mukui. Alan Mukui is uh, has a tremendous experience, significant experience in this area of digital lending. He is the, the general manager of a digital lending platform called uh, Kamoa. Yes, Kamoa, and he's also a director in another digital lending platform called Kuwazo. And beyond that, he is also a board member of the. Uh, it was previously called known as the Digital Lenders Association of Kenya, but they recently rebranded to Digital Financial Service Providers Association of Kenya, and he is a board member in that association. He will be telling us more about the association, and from his vast experience and knowledge in this area of digital lending, there will be so much for us to learn today. So, with that, allow me to introduce our guest speaker for today, Alan Mukwe. Please take over. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Njoki. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all the attendees and the lawyers, partners, associates at uh, Njogu and Associates. First, I'll just cover briefly who is DFSAC or DFSAK, and then we'll then discuss uh, a bit more about digital lending. We were formerly known as the Digital Lenders Association, uh, founded back in the beginning of 2019, and this is a purely voluntary uh, member association. We were then formally uh, you know, registered in May of 2019 as, as an association under the Registrar of Societies. Uh, we started out with about 10 founding members, and that has grown to 25 uh, members uh, that we have at the moment. And DLAC was founded on uh, DIFSAC was founded to with three main objectives. The first was just to bring like-minded people uh, within the digital lending space together. Uh, we realized that we had, you know, everyone prior to 2019, everyone was sort of doing their own little thing in their own little silo. And we did not have a forum where we could all come together and talk to each other. And so we decided let's create this coalition of the willing uh, to come together and discuss you know matters that affect us and primarily this is for mission driven uh, farms i would say mission driven fintechs those who want to do the right thing and want to make money but want to make money ethically 
The second objective was to create a central channel uh, where you, you know, we could engage with stakeholders. Um, you know, we had this problem where we are individual farms and each farm is trying to do different things with different players and stakeholders in the market. And primarily, if you, especially if you, if, if you have experience engaging with government, uh, government doesn't like dealing with individual companies. They prefer to deal with industry bodies or associations like ourselves, where we represent the voice of the general subsector. And so we came together for that purpose. And the third was to create a body of work around research uh, and do more research projects uh, so that we can better inform our customers and we can better inform the market. Because there was also a lot of misinformation around digital lending and a lot of things were not clear. And it wasn't anyone's fault is that there wasn't any centralized uh, path for people to gain knowledge or to acquire knowledge on digital lending. Our first most important objective was to bring together the like-minded mission-driven fintechs was then to develop a code of conduct. And this code of conduct will cover bits and pieces of it as we go through this presentation. Uh, but the main goals were as listed there. I won't go through all of them, but it was around, you know, making sure that we protect the consumer, making sure that our practices and our operations are ethical, making sure that we practice risk-based pricing, uh, help fostering you know, good corporate governance amongst our member organizations. Digital lending as defined by, you know, the and, and I pulled this definition from the DCP regulations given by the central bank, is a, a digital lender or a digital credit provider, which is the actual, uh, you know, legally recognized term, is a, a person or an entity that engages in the arrangement or provision of credit facilities or loan services through digital channels, yeah? So, Digital lending is a subset of a larger industry called fintech. And I'm sure you've come across that word severally. And fintech in very simple terms is financial technology. It's a sort of catch-all phrase these days that describes you know, any firms or any companies engaged in software, mobile applications, or technologies that are specifically touching the financial sector or the financial services sector. And this is quite broad. This is from not only lending, uh, but payments, uh, blockchain, uh, it's quite broad. So the way to think about FinTech is any technology-based service or product that touches uh, financial services that may be considered as, uh, 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 as part of the FinTech industry. The key thing to remember here is that the digital in the digital lending is just purely a channel. It's lending, yeah? So if you understand lending, you'll understand digital lending. Um, then all that the digital part of it does is that it, it enables companies to lend faster, cheaper, and at far bigger scale than would traditionally be possible. If you think about the not so distant past, uh, for you to be able to have a country operation, you basically needed something to the tune of 600 branches you know, across the country. You needed to be in every county, have a brick and mortar, hire people, ETC. And of course, you can imagine the sort of cost associated with that. Now with technology, you know, as a, as a fintech company or a digital lending provider, you can provide services across the country, across the region even, without necessarily have the commensurate number of branches in each of these uh, places that your customers are physically present in. How many companies are there? And so I put this screen to just say there are very, very many. Yeah, we there are more than you know we can keep track of, and they keep changing. Some keep coming up, others keep falling. It is see, so it keeps the landscape keeps changing quite quite a bit. As of 2020, the beginning of 2023, there were about 300 digital lending apps uh, on the App Store. And with both App Store, uh, Apple, I think maybe only two or three players are in that space. And also players who are not in that space, they are digital lenders, but they are not on Play Store. But they have a website or they have another digital channel they're using to disperse. The primary mode is still Google Play Store. So the, when we talk about digital lending, what most of us know is uh, you know, a sort of mobile app that is on your Android phone. 
Uh, however, the biggest digital channels, you know, people forget is things like USSD. That is one of the biggest channel. Um, and a fun fact to know is that actually the biggest digital lenders are banks. Between Fuliza, Mshwari, and KCB Mpesa, they make up about 90% of the digital lending up. A digital lending market, sorry. Now, of the non-bank digital lenders, uh, they make about 10% of the market. They disburse uh, somewhere between 8 to 10% of the market. They disburse about 4 billion shillings a month to about 5 million customers. So this is not, when you look at, say, private sector lending as a whole for a country, uh, the number might seem small, but if you look at the number of customers we touch, number of individual customers we touch, you will see that it's quite a number. Um, the key drivers here, when we look at digital lending and why digital lending has done, you know, considerably well in Kenya versus in other markets across Africa or even Asia, there's very high mobile money penetration. So, you know, M-Pesa is our, one of our key, I call it one of our key exports to the world. Uh, within the financial services sector all over the world, no one doesn't know M-Pesa. No one doesn't know that M-Pesa actually originated from Kenya. The second thing is that the Kenyan population has very high literacy levels if you compare us to the rest of our African counterparts. And we also have an affinity for technology assimilation. So if you've had the opportunity of traveling across several African countries, you'll notice a key difference between them and us is even our neighbors across the East Africa community is that we really take up new technology, new, uh, new innovations, new products very quickly. And Kenyans are always willing to try anything that makes their life more efficient, which has led to this sort of explosion within that sector. The third thing, and this is a critical pillar, is the existence of the CIS framework. CIS stands for Credit Information Sharing Framework. And this is supported by the existence of three credit reference bureaus. I'm sure you know of, you have heard of, you know, uh, uh, CRB uh, or blacklisting as people like to call it. Um, uh, there is TransUnion, there is Credit Info, and there is Metropole. And the fourth area has been generally a low private sector lending by commercial banks and the need to grow financial inclusion primarily in the informal sector. So of the, as I alluded to, of the whole, you know, private sector lending book, which is about 3.5 trillion that has been issued by bank, very little of that is retail and very little of that is in the informal sector. We have seen digital, we do see digital lending in, across the African continent, but of course not as much or as ubiquitous as we see it uh, in our country here in Kenya. Of course, the financial inclusion story is a key part. Uh, here, this slide, uh, I picked this from FSD, which is financial sector deepening that sort of shows, uh, you know, the growth in financial inclusion. Uh, we, I think we are the highest, if not the second, actually, yes, we are the highest uh, country with the most number of people included in the financial services space. Uh, currently, we stand somewhere in the region of the 90% plus, which is which is very remarkable. Uh, if, uh, again, I'll use the example of our African continent. Uh, most of our other counterparts range between around 65 to around 85% financial inclusion across the country. Uh, in Kenya, we, we are sort of much more on the higher side. And one of the things that has really encouraged that has been the, the explosion of digital lending. So prior to 2019, we didn't have much in terms of regulatory oversight. Uh, the reason for this is that, you know, this sector is very new. I think you know, digital, the, the earliest forms of digital lending we saw in Kenya came up, I think, around 2015, 2016. So if you look at time-wise, that is maybe only eight years versus, you know, our banking sector has existed in excess of 50 years plus. Uh, prior to 2019, actually, literally all you have to do, you had to do was register a company and uh, you're good to go. You can start uh, lending, get an M-Pesa pay bill and you can go ahead. Um, however, since then, uh, you know, we the first thing we saw was uh, we had the 
the Data Protection Act that was passed back in 2019, and that led to the formation of the Office of the Data Protection Commission, ODPC. And in mid-2020, towards the end, I think towards the end of 2020, is when um, the, the first data commissioner was appointed, uh, Madam Kasait, and that office began uh, operating and their mandate primarily is to look at data privacy and consumer protection. Number two is that in around uh, 2020, late 2020, we had the CBK amendment bill that was brought up in parliament and were heavily involved in the drafting of this bill uh, that then was passed into law in December of 2021. So as we crossed over into 2022, the central bank then released substantive regulation around how digital credit providers would be licensed and regulated. So as you can see, the regulation that we have around you know, DCPs is very, very fresh. It's very new. In fact, we are still in the era where up the central bank is going through applications to approve uh, digital credit providers. So at the moment, you're kind of looking, so the second section is just the laws that you touch, of course, the Companies Act, uh, the Data Controller, the Data Protection Act of 2019. Um, you know, you will need to be registered. You can choose to be registered as a DCP uh, or a microfinance or a bank. So depending on which sort of organization you're running, you then fall under those three different acts uh, of the law. Um, then, of course, your county operation, area of operation, you'll need your normal business permits, fire permits, etc. Um, and those are just normal, you know, county government level uh, licenses that, that, that are required. The rules only apply to those who are licensed. If an entity or a firm or a person is not licensed, of course, the rules don't apply to them because then they are not, they are not operating within the law. Everyone who wants to do this business should be licensed. And most Shylocks will, are not licensed. I'm pretty sure of that. And they don't operate within the law. So if you are taking money, please, please, as much as possible, borrow from licensed entities, whether fintechs or banks or SACOs, ETC. Why? Because then you have protections under the law. If you borrow from a Shylock, you have no protection under the law. The first thing has been, uh, you know, predatory lending. Predatory lending is two things. One, it's forcing, you would say, forcing loans down the throats of people who you know cannot uh, cannot afford to repay those loans. And this is sort of creating a, a system of usury. And this is nothing new. It has existed in other forms before the era of digital, uh, whether you want to call them loan sharks or uh, money lenders, ETC. There are, there are various other forms of predatory lending that have always been there. Um, the second biggest problem we've seen, biggest concern here is unethical debt collection practices or what is commonly known as debt shaming. And this is the process of where, you know, you've taken a loan from a company for whatever reason, one reason or another, you've not been able to pay part or the whole amount of the loan. And so the loan company then take it upon themselves to, you know, talk to your next of kin, talk to your people in your contacts, ETC, to try and shame you or, you know, motivate you to pay uh, your debt or send messages uh, to try and 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 get you to, to repay their loans. The third concern is around data privacy. And this is a big deal because, you know, data privacy laws in Kenya are still fairly young. Um, we are in the process with uh, working with ODPC to re to release uh, very sector specific uh, regulation around data privacy and privacy policy. Of key concern here is what information is being collected, and have the users given active consent. These are your terms and conditions. Terms and conditions should be in simple language, and you should be able to give your active consent to say, I understand the information I am giving out, and I accept for that information to be used. The other thing about data privacy is that that information, if it's being then shared with third parties or being sold to someone else, it should also be included there because you, as the data owner, this information belongs to you. You must be able to consent uh, specifically to that. 
The, that is, the fourth issue here, not so much an issue these days. We have really worked with the relevant parties to kill a lot of these areas, though there are still issues there, is around fraud and more specifically identity theft. I'm sure you've had cases, very many cases of in the past of SIM swaps or someone's ID being taken and registering a SIM card and then the SIM card goes and takes loans with various other parties UTC and then this person who never took a loan now all of a sudden is burdened by 10 different loans, uh, loan companies telling me, hey, you know, you need to pay us. Uh, and of course, consumer financial literacy is a, is, a, is a big issue as well. So one of the biggest problems we're still tackling is and will be a problem for maybe a couple of more years is around people having more than they can, people biting more than they can chew. So traditionally, you know, you typically had maybe one relationship with a bank, one relationship with your circle. Um, it was very easy. You would go, they'd give you a loan. And in the old days, in the 90s, early 2000s, rarely did you ever see someone with more than two loans. Most of them were salaried, so it was a checkoff system. Uh, but now in the era of digital loans, and especially unsecured digital loans, you find a lot of people are taking these very small short-term loans, and they're taking so many of them that then now they get to a position where they can no longer be able to service all their loans on time. So the first is just purely a market play. The market, in my opinion, is still underserved. We have about yeah, 3.4 trillion shillings in private sector lending. We still have a gap of about 500 billion to a trillion shilling in terms of financing every year. The, the reports that come out, I think this was from a World Bank report, is that there's still a gap of about 500 billion in terms of lending that, that is required within the private sector in Kenya because banks are simply not meeting enough demand here. The second one is credit product specialization. So one of the things we are seeing as the market evolves is that we started out, of course, in this sort of copycat era where everyone was sort of doing you know, the same thing, where the typical product was uh, a loan for um, a 5,000 shilling loan for about 30 days. Uh, that is unsecured and delivered to your M-Pesa straight, and then you pay via M-Pesa. However, those digital products are now evolving. We are seeing a lot more players who are becoming very subsector specific. You have some players who are only, you know, dealing or lending within the border border space. You have others who are targeting certain blue collar guilds, like say electricians or carpenters or tailors. The ones we are seeing exploding now is uh, smartphone uh, lending or smartphone financing, device financing, where we secure the loan versus against the actual smartphone that you're, you're going to buy. So I think we, there's a lot more work to be done in terms of product specialization, because as you know, the MSME space is quite, quite huge. It's the biggest employer in the country. However, it's it's not a one, you know, one size fits all. Uh, a lot more work has to be done to better categorize the subsectors within the MSME space and then figure out how to best serve um, those specific markets. Um, so thank you for listening to me for more than 10 minutes. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. So you can brief now. And I'm happy to take any questions. We are always deducted insurance from loans before money is credited to the account. What's the purpose of that insurance? This is quite common in when you take a bank or um, MFI uh, facility. Um, the insurance is supposed to cover two things. It's supposed to cover death of the insured person. And number two, it's supposed to cover the case of permanent disability. The terms and conditions differ a bit, so which is why it's important to always read the TNCs and see. In the case of, let me take myself, I've taken a car loan from Standard Chartered. Uh, then for, you know, God forbid, I pass away and I've not finished my loan or, you know, I'm in an accident and permanently disabled, I can't work anymore, I lose my job. ETC, and so I cannot pay or service the loan anymore, the insurance policy is supposed to kick in uh, to do that. However, there are certain cases where, say, the loan was guaranteed by another person, where even if you have insurance, the guarantor, and that's the, 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 the job of the guarantor, the guarantor is supposed to step in uh, to, to pay or to service the remainder of, of, of that loan. The second question was around... Um, 
key leg the key regulatory facets that came up from central bank so in the invention and the creation of the dcp regulation the central bank was trying to primarily tackle the issue of consumer protection and within that issue there were several sub issues that they needed to tackle the first was that a lot of digital lenders were accused of being shell companies or ghost companies these companies have just a website they have no physical presence you don't know who the employees are you don't know who the directors are you don't know who the shareholders are which meant that even in the case of if you needed to go after someone or you know have an issue addressed you didn't know where to or who would help you out and so the first thing that the regulation was doing was saying everyone who is working with the digital credit provider space needs to be licensed. And the first step to be licensed is that there's a very lengthy form. There's a very, very detailed uh, form that you have to fill out. And in that form, you do a lot of KYC. You will write out who your shareholders are, who your directors are, who your uh, key personnel in the organization are, what your system looks like, uh, what the code looks like, uh, what your products are, what's the interest rate on those products, where is your physical office, and in fact on this the, the central bank conducts a physical site review where they, they want to come and see these are your actual offices. Um, they'll interview a couple of people in your organization, they may choose to do so as well. So that was the first thing, it needed to establish a framework for KYC, so that anyone who now complains to, you know, if Wanjiko of the street comes and complains about say Kuazo, there is a place where they can go and, uh, you know, if they go to CBK and say, hey, you know, Kuazo is harassing me, they know this is Kuazo, this is the person we need to go after. So that was the first thing it did. The second thing it did is that it set out a framework for reporting and compliance. So as a licensed digital credit provider, you're required to provide compliance uh, reporting monthly, almost like what a bank does. So the first thing you provide is that you provide, uh, you know, a system report, you provide the number of loans you've given, the number of loans you've collected, ETC, um, any major customer complaints, any major changes in your operational flow, any changes in your address or your office, all that information you have to provide uh, to the central bank on a monthly basis. And this helps with continuous monitoring and evaluation that the central bank is able to see that yes, as a company, you are actually doing what you're supposed to do. The third thing it did is that it now regulates the information that is going into the credit information sharing framework. One of the problems that we used to have in the past is that a lender would give you a loan today, say Kuazo gives you a loan of 5,000 shillings, uh, for whatever reason you delay to repay, but eventually you pay and you've paid. But I would be very quick to go to CRB and report you and say, hey, ah, you know, Alan has not paid his loan. But then when you cleared your loan, I am not submitting that information. So one of the requirements of the new DCP regulations is that you must do what is called full file reporting. So I not only report the bad people who are borrowing from me and not repaying, I also report all the good people who have borrowed and repaid their loans. And the purpose of that is so that your credit score within the CRBs can actually go up and you can demonstrate that you, you are a good borrower. Yeah, And also that reporting framework that within 48 hours, I must report. Yeah, and so if there is any issue, and you know this is all done electronically now, it's not. I'm not submitting a physical file to CRB. That will actually over time be cut down to real time. So those I would say are the three main areas that that the central bank has done. The regulations go into detail a lot around you know who can form a DCP. There is a whole requirement for fit and proper uh, because all your you know your directors and key uh, key uh, personnel within the organization must also be vetted by the central bank to make sure that one they do have the competency to to run a financial institution and number two that they are well aware they are people of good standing in society. Uh, you know, like we were actually asked to even submit, you know, certificate of good conduct, ETC, you, EACC documents and all that stuff to, to show that, you know, even our own personal bank statements to actually show that, you know, we are in good standing uh, in, in, within the Kenyan, uh, the Kenyan society. The other question that I've been asked is specifically on debt collection procedures and as it relates to the uh, DCP regulations. 
a couple of things have been set out and this I uh, remember is an evolving document a lot more very specific regulations will come out but the first thing and this is your right as a consumer is if you have taken an unsecured and I'm not only talking about unsecured facilities the only person who should be contacted in regards to your loan is you this sort of collection information on guarantors or next of kin or secondary contact etc is not permissible because uh, next of kin has also not given has not, not given the right for the information to be used or them to be contacted on behalf of my loan if a digital lender or any other lender has not given you the opportunity to accept or deny to be a guarantor or an next of kin etc that loan should not be given and they should not reach out to you because you're not a party to that contract you are not aware they shouldn't call you in fact that is harassment to you uh, who's being called as a guarantor or a, or a next of kin you should have been made aware the second collection practice is that in the case of an unsecured loan the lender cannot come after your assets or property or threaten you in any way. That is not allowed because the facility is unsecured and that's the risk. And that's why typically unsecured facilities are lent at a much higher rate than secured facility. Because for secured lending, there's a whole, the other laws, there's the Auctioneers Act, ETC. Even in the event that uh, they are calling you or following up on their loan, they're only supposed to call you, you know, within business hours. What does the layman need to know as far as their data is concerned? The first thing I always tell people is try as much as possible and read the TNCs, the terms and conditions, read the privacy policy. I know we are fond of not reading the fine print. We don't read, when we open a box, we don't read the manual. However, uh, in the case of loan and, and this sort of any contract that is given in front of you, you should try as much as possible and read everything. The reason is because it's legally binding. Is there a prescribed model for terms and conditions? No. This is one of the things we are working with the Office of the Data Protection Commission to come up with. So I always urge people, please read through the terms and conditions, read through the privacy policy. It contains within it all the information around what data they are collecting from you, and what they are using it for. If that information then is also being shared with third parties, they should also tell you this information will be shared with other parties for this and this purpose. The other thing that is required is active consent. Now, active consent means either you tick a box or you have a question that pops on the screen and asks you, do you agree with the terms and conditions? And you say yes, or it tells you, you know, do you agree with the terms and condition? Press one for yes, press two for no. It should be explicit. And that information is stored within the servers of the lender to say this person on this day at this time, we asked them for their consent on ABCD and they agreed. I think even as you are signing up for this call, when you filled out the form, there was a section there that asked you for consent to give this information to Njogu and Associates. Yeah. There's also this issue, I have, I have been a victim of this where, you know, I think it happened, and, and, and when it happened then, I, I didn't actually know there was a, a way I could report that someone sent me a message that I had guaranteed a loan to so and so, I was not aware of that loan, and I was like, this is strange to me. So if such a thing happens, what, what is the channel that is available for you to report such a lender? The primary place you can report right now is the Office of the Data Corp. Uh, protection commission so the odpc website there is a section for filing a complaint you can either file a complaint of your you know your data being misused or you're receiving spam calls etc or you can file a case of a data breach where say you're working in an organization and you realize there has been a data breach you can also file for that i can assure you the data the office of the data protection commission does actually look at those complaints because there are there are two lenders actually two digital lenders and a gaming company that have been fined 5 million shillings each for breaches in the data protection act so the more you report the more cases you bring to them, the more they are willing to, to, to act on, on those cases. You can also report to the central bank and say, hey, you know, this lender is, is, you know, is harassing me, is doing ABCD, has not cleared my loan yet, I've paid or ABCD. You can report that as well to, to the central bank. So those are the two main bodies that you can report to. In the case of, um, in the case of 
members of the Digital Lenders Association. We also on our website have a tab for complaints and we also look at those complaints. How do you determine the credit worthiness of the customers in this digital lending? I just have an app. These people, they don't know me. They don't know where I live. They have the they don't know how much I earn, they don't know about my businesses, but they're telling me we can give you a loan of 20,000. So how would you determine that I am worth a loan of 20,000? Credit profiling does three main things. So the first thing we want to establish is who you are. That's called KYC or know your customer. We want to know that if we are dealing with Alan, it's Alan. Now, unlike the traditional model where you had to walk into a bank branch and you know you we would physically see you and take a picture to see. In digital lending, we you know I'm lending to someone in Isiolo and I've never met him, I've never seen him in my life. So I have to figure out how do I actually identify that if it is Alan I am dealing with, it's actually Alan. So that's, that's the first step. The second thing, which is now the credit bit of it, is we need to identify the ability to repay and the willingness to repay. Yeah, and those are two things. So the ability to repay just tells me, based on your financial health and what you're doing, either with your business or other person, can I see that you have the financial capability over the time of the loan, whether it's a one month, six months, one year, whatever loan, are you able to repay that loan? And then the next thing I have to establish is your willingness to repay. So you can have a portion, and it's quite a substantial portion of people who they have the ability to repay, they're just refusing to repay. You know? And how do I establish your willingness to repay? I will usually look at your history, and that's where the CRB and the credit pro credit scoring comes in. On the ability, I will look at you know, I can ask you, say, for your bank statements. More commonly, we ask for M-Pesa statements. I look at your past M-Pesa history. And based on that, I can do what is called an income proxy, income and expense proxy, and figure out, you know, how much I think you're, you're, you're able to sustain in terms of repayments over the duration of the loan and then decide how, um, I, 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 whether or not I'm going to give you the loan. What are the risks involved with respect to the lender? You're giving all these loans, they are unsecured loans. What happens if all of these people don't pay? What happens when they default and the loan is unsecured? So the main risk is, and that is why you know we are in business, the main risk is that people don't repay you. If I lend out a hundred, a shilling to a hundred people, so a hundred shillings, and I am lending it at 20%. And so I'm lending it at 20 shillings interest. And so total principal plus interest is going to be 120. And then the people who are not going to pay me back are going to be worth 10 shillings. It means I will have made 120 shillings minus the 10 shillings, 110 shillings, minus my principal 100 shillings, which is my, you know, my money for business. And I'm left with a 10 shilling profit. So the balance of, of lending really is making sure that the proportion of your defaults or non-performing loans, what we call NPLs, is lower than the total interest that you earn from your loans. Now, the trick with digital lending is that you have to do this very quickly and you have to do it at scale. Why? Because you know digital loans are known to be almost instantaneous, they're very quick, and you have to do it to, for millions and millions of people. So for instance, in the case of Kuazo, we have somewhere in the region of 350,000 customers. So you can imagine if say even 50K of them are coming for loans at once, you have to be able to do your analysis, disperse to these customers, you know, instantaneously. Someone else is asking, how are players dealing with the question of excise duty on fees? What happens if the only charges a digital lender levies is interest on loan? So excise duty does apply to all credit providers, including digital lenders. There is excise duty on fees for digital lenders, and it's the same one that applies to all financial services. Um, we do expect a change in the law. It may include also interest. We are not too sure until the Finance Act is passed. Um, but yes, it's treated that. And the lenders may choose to show you or not show you and bunch it all up in all the other fees and interest when they show you how much you're going to pay in terms of repayment. As uh, much as the law is willing to protect, to protect the consumer, we also have a responsibility to do our due diligence. So how, where do I check whether a lender where, where the lender is licensed? Very good question. Thank you, Njoki. So on the central bank website, they do have a list of the licensed uh, 
the digital credit providers. And that's also just under bank supervision. So they have a whole list of all the licensed banks, the licensed circles, the licensed MFIs, the licensed DCPs, they, all of them are listed there. And that list is constantly updated because this, remember these DCP licenses are new. They're always, they're issuing new ones as almost every month they're issuing like 10 new ones, yeah? That's the best place to go and see what is exactly licensed by the, the regulator. Thank you so, so much, Alan, for that informative session.